Okay, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. And uh, maybe so some of you will be good morning and also some of you will be good evening. So uh, first of all, thanks for joining the webinar. So, uh, so we, today we will talk about uh, copyright, creative commons and OER in virtual instruction. So thanks for joining. Uh, actually, just first of all, uh, actually, uh, you can actually use the, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A button to raise questions. Uh, we will uh, answer questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we also have today, we have uh, two speakers today. Uh, first of all, by the way, so uh, definitely this uh, webinar is sponsored by a uh, UGC project for e teaching for you, as well as uh, actual BOE uh, region tank and actual upon concession. And I just post the uh, link for the today's slide back. So you can actually uh, use it uh, in the future or share to other colleagues. And today's uh, uh, webinar is also uh, live streamed on uh, YouTube. You can also share the live stream, uh, live stream videos to colleagues also. Okay, so first of all, I would like to introduce uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Alice from Faculty of Law, and also a senior fellow from Aspans HD, and also co-founder for Creative Commons Hong Kong. And I'm Leon, so also uh, have a rare set of hats in Hong Kong U, in, also in uh, actual BU Hong Kong. And I also uh, got a certificate from uh, as a uh, uh, CC educator from Creative Commons Association last year. So it's, it's very uh, rewarding. So that's why I would like to, uh, actually, both of us would like to share experience and observations on this uh, copyright as well as CC and OER. Okay, so uh, some more promotion. So uh, just uh, this is a, uh, one of the webinar for the uh, e teaching for you uh, project. So we organize webinars, workshops, co and conference and research on how to improve teachers for the next stage uh, virtual instruction. Um, and we will have also some other webinars. For example, next week will be a colleague from uh, Poly U and uh, Polytechnic University, as well as Chinese University, uh, uh, Darren and also Paul and also their colleagues to talk about uh, hybrid instruction. So for for PolyU and CU, they go for hybrid instruction uh, uh, this uh, semester, so that's why they also would like to share the experience. So feel free to uh, check for their, uh, the contents and also register the, uh, uh, the, uh, register the webinar and know more from them. Okay, so today we will talk about, mainly we will separate the discussion into two parts. The first part will be more on copyright. Uh, Alice will, is an, one of the experts. Uh, we'll talk about copyright in virtual instruction, I will talk about more on CC and OER, uh, more on an uh, overall perspective. And we will talk, and I will actually want to, want to share one case from, uh, it's called Wikipedia Assignment. So it's, a, a, it's actually something quite worthwhile to explore and to do experiment. So again, just some enrichment from RWA and as well as uh, UGC. Okay, uh, uh, we may not have, uh, we may not have, uh, uh, 19 meter today, but we actually ask uh, colleagues, uh, ask uh, the registrations, ask you for uh, giving us some questions in advance. So we actually gather some of them and we also have some more. So we try to address uh, most of the questions you raised, uh, you mentioned in the registration form. Hope you actually uh, learn something interesting and helpful. Okay, uh, by the way, so this project is actually, this fragment is actually incubated or based on a, a project actually work with Alice uh, and we together, it's a core copyright classroom. We have a TDG teaching German grant uh, some years ago and create a series of videos. So first thing of them, so covering copyright and creative comment, you can see the last two. And uh, they, there is an English version as well as Cantonese version. So uh, addressing copyright uh, in uh, TNL for students, for uh, teachers and for different uh, participants. So uh, if you want to, also, want to also share the video, so feel free to click this link and to uh, chat on this or share to colleagues or students. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to pass my mic to Alice to talk about uh, copyright issues in TNL. So let me pass the mic to Alice. Thank you so much, Leon. Um, this is my screen and I will be talking about copyright and creative commons in teaching and learning. Um, so a bit of... Um, Introduction. So I am Alice from the University of Hong Kong and also a co-founder of CCHK. So today we have these four takeaways. What is copyright? And who has, <laughs> all right, just a minute. 
All right. What is copyright? Who has copyright? How to enforce copyright and how to avoid copyright infringement? For these four takeaways, we will be looking at them in this order. And welcome again to this um, webinar. Copyright Creative Commons, they are interrelated. So we're going to look at their interaction um, later on. Now, first, what is copyright? I would say it is the creator's exclusive rights. And who has copyright then? Of course, it would be the creator, unless that means there are exceptions. And number three, how to enforce copyright then? Well, we have civil and criminal um, liabilities for copyright infringement. Finally, how to avoid copyright infringement? I have three proposals, three tips for you, and that would be proportion, purpose, and permission. This will be the framework of my sharing. And first of all, let us make it very clear that this is just a sharing. We are not giving any legal advice. And we know that we have friends, participants from different places, different territories. So we will try to give you a global picture. And interestingly, copyright is indeed a global issue because it affects everyone, every teacher, every student in every place. I mean, not just Hong Kong, not just the Philippines, but all over the world. So hopefully by the end of um, the first half of this seminar, we will be able to look at these four questions one by one. First question, what is copyright? Now, let me give you an um, icebreaking question. So let's say there are five items here. Let's see which one is the odd one out. First, a teacher's email, I wrote this. Second, a student's drama, a student's presentation. Number three, a child's song. That means a child composed his own song. Number four, a baby's artwork. That means it's just a 17 month year old baby, but he was able to produce his own artwork. And number five, a vaccine. Now, of course, I don't take a vaccine photo by myself, and therefore this is actually a CC licensed photo. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about these five items. Which one is the odd one out? Which one is not protected by copyright? And we are talking about copyright in every place because copyright is an internationalized topic. What we have in Hong Kong would be the same in the Philippines, would be the same in the United Kingdom, in the United States, because we have an international framework for copyright protection. Okay, the few seconds are gone. What is your vote for the odd one out? Now, let me tell you. I would say the odd one out is the vaccine. Now that is because the first four items, they are respectively literary work, dramatic work, musical work, and artistic work. In other words, literary means anything that is in writing or made up of words, then it is literary work. Even though it is just a very mundane, ordinary email, it can still be classified as a literary work for the purpose of copyright protection. Dramatic, a drama definitely is a dramatic work. Musical, it doesn't really matter whether the person composing the music is musically trained or not. So even a child's composition can be a musical work. And a baby's artwork, it can be artistic so long as it is original. That means it is not copied. So you can see here, we have three takeaways from this very simple icebreaking question. First, copyright only protects things that are original in the sense that it is not copied. So even a child's or baby's work, if it is not copied from someone else, it would be sufficiently original. Number two, copyright arises automatically. That means you need not apply, need not register, and you not pay for it. So it is very different from other types of intellectual property rights. And number three, copyright lasts for the author's life plus 50 years in most, but not all of the places in the world. I will elaborate a bit on this. And how about the vaccine, the odd one out? It is something that is groundbreaking. Let's say it is a vaccine for COVID-19. So shouldn't it be uh, protected by law somehow? Of course, we all agree that it should get some legal protection, but not necessarily copyright protection. So I would suggest that a vaccine, which is a scientific breakthrough, can enjoy a patent if you can successfully apply for one. And the maximum duration would be only 20 years. And it makes sense because this is something that would be making huge contribution to the mankind. So it cannot last for too long. It would not be life of the author plus 50 years. We can't really wait that long. And if that is okay, then I would like to show you. Remember, we just talked about the duration of copyright. Is it necessarily life of the author plus 50 years? This is a distribution map of all the copyright jurisdictions in the world. You can see on the left, actually, 
most countries, most places in the world would choose life of the author plus 50 years. In other words, all the yellow places, can you see, including China, the Philippines, and most of the Southeast Asian countries, uh, you can see would be life plus 50 years. And how about the places with the brown shading, like the um, United Kingdom, Europe, United States, or Australia, they go for life of the author plus 70 years. Now, I just want to use this to show you a few takeaways. First of all, this is a map I just got from Wikipedia. Am I authorized to use this photo for, for use this diagram for this seminar purpose? The answer is yes. Can you see the bottom right? Click more details, then you would be able to see the license. This is a CC licensed map. Now, let me show you. You click more details, then you will be able Oh, this map is actually created by this author, and he has granted us permission to use this map, this diagram. We can share, we can remix, so long as we give him the attribution. That means we say the name of the author, and we have just done this. So this is just one example to show you that Creative Commons is everywhere, and it is so convenient for us to do sharing, to do seminars, and to do teaching and learning, in particular in the virtual online environment. Another very important website I would introduce to you would be this World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, or we also call it the WIPO. The WIPO actually, it's the organization, as you see from the name, responsible for promoting and um, enforcing intellectual property rights in the world, and the most relevant international convention for copyright protection would be this Bern Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works, which was adopted in the year 1886. And since then, it has already got 179 contracting parties. And what does it provide? That it provides creators such as authors, musicians, poets, painters, with the means to control how their works are used, by whom, and on, on what terms. Now, why I'm showing you this website? Again, I have two takeaways. First, who are the contracting parties? Remember I said at the beginning that copyright is a global issue because it has the international framework. So whether no matter where you are, we have more or less the same principles. And let me show you. There are 179 contracting parties, including all these, including many, if not most, or all of the Southeast Asian countries, territories, and places, including China, India, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, Pakistan, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, and of course, uh, some other countries in the world. And another takeaway, so this is some very useful website. Another takeaway we have is that whenever we want to use, say, a website in virtual instruction, let's say in our teaching and learning, we want to show students some useful information from a website. Are we allowed to do this? One very practical tip would be always go to the very bottom of the website and check the terms of use or their copyright notice. So in this case, it is called the terms of use under the Whitepool website. You click on that, which is usually at the bottom of the website, and this is what you will see. It says, this is the terms of use. Unless specified otherwise, anyone may reproduce, distribute, adapt, translate, and publicly perform the content on the WIPO website and online services, provided that the content is accompanied by an acknowledgement that WIPO is the source. This is exactly what I have done. Therefore, I am permitted to use and to show this website to all of you during this webinar. And you can also do the same during your own sharing, your own teaching and learning, or your own virtual instruction. And so here, I have highlighted the um, key words for you. The first thing we note is that these five words, reproduce, distribute, adapt, translate, and publicly perform, these are actually examples of a copyright creator's exclusive rights. In other words, if you want to do any of these things, you should get the permission of the copyright owner, otherwise it would be copyright infringement. But how can we get the permission of the copyright owner if we don't even know the copyright owner then? Creative Commons is a very, very useful tool. So here, can you see, the WIPOL website is actually authorized to everyone in the world under the Creative Commons Attribution License. So what we learn from this is that this is how we can avoid infringement. Creative Commons License is a kind of 
permission that you can give even to people you do not know, just like this WIPO website. It is giving us this license, that means this permission, to use the content of this website. Even though we don't know the WIPO organization, we have not approached them specifically, we are permitted. So this is just an example of how CC license can operate and can help us in virtual instruction. I still haven't finished what is copyright because what I want to share with you is not just knowledge, but also some skills. I want to show all of you, how can we find the law? How can we find useful resources about content of copyright law, how to avoid copyright, so on and so forth. So I have A and B here. A, how to find the law for a particular place, a particular territory. So it is very simple, I can tell you. All copyright laws in the world, you can actually search by the name of the place and then add copyright law. Let me give you a very simple demonstration. If you do a Google search for, say, Philippines copyright law, you just type these three words, quotation marks, because that's what I did last night, you will be able to see the Republic Act number 8293, which will lay down the intellectual property right the intellectual property law in the Philippines, and then you just scroll down a little bit to part four of the act, then you'll be able to see all the relevant provisions about copyright protection in the Philippines. So you can just type whatever the name of the place, whether it is the Philippines, Japan, Korea, Singapore, and then copyright law, you will be able to find the relevant legislation. Everything is available online for free. You don't have to pay for it. How about my own hometown? Hong Kong, then I can give you an even a shortcut because Hong Kong, I actually know the name of the piece of legislation. It is called the Copyright Ordinance in Hong Kong. So you can just search Copyright Ordinance and you will be able to see the relevant legislation. Or you can type CAP 528. Again, you will be able to go to the legislation online. And CAP 528 actually stands for Chapter 528 of the Laws of Hong Kong. So now you can see every piece of legislation, whether in the Philippines, in Hong Kong, in United Kingdom, in United States, will be given a chapter number. So it will be convenient if you know the chapter number. But even if you don't, you simply search the name of the place plus copyright law, then you will be able to look at the online version of the legislation. It is very, very convenient. And I encourage you all to do this right now. I can wait for you. I mean, if you have your cell phone with you, just take it out and just type wherever you are, Philippines, Japan, Korea, copyright law, just click search, then you will be able to see the relevant online version of your legislation for copyright protection. So this is one takeaway, one skill you have just acquired through this webinar. Another skill, what if I actually want a little bit more information from the government organization on what is copyright, what is other intellectual property rights? So I want a more overview of intellectual property right protection in my hometown. Then I would also be showing you what search words you should be using. If you want to find useful resources in particular from official government websites, then again, you can type copyright plus some keywords. For example, in India and in United States, they call their responsible government office the Copyright Office. So if you simply type Copyright Office, India, United States, you will be able to see their government body, their website responsible for copyright promotion. I have also checked in the Philippines, in the United Kingdom, they call the relevant office the Intellectual Property Office. So you just type these three words plus the place of um, the name of your place, then you will be able to see the official website. How about my hometown, Hong Kong? It is called the Intellectual Property Department, or you simply type IPD, the acronym, then immediately you can go to the online version. It looks like this. So this is the um, official website of the Intellectual Property Department of the government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. On this website, you can get information, not just about copyright, but also about other types of intellectual property rights, such as trademarks, patents, and design. So this is a very, very useful skill. I hope you have just acquired. Okay, so, so much for what is copyright. Now, the second question, who has copyright? These are two of the questions that we have received from the registrants. First, who owns 
student created items that are created for a course. That means student created works, maybe their homework, their assignment, or even their exam script. Who owns the copyright? Or their presentation materials? Who owns the copyright in student created works? That is number one. And number two, we have this question. Who owns the teaching materials that are created by an instructor? So these two questions, they are focusing on student created works and instructor created works. Do you remember what I said at the very beginning of the seminar? I hope you do. And it should be, who has copyright? It should be the creator, unless dot, 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 because we have some special exceptional situations. So what are these special exceptional situations? I'm going to tell you. For the first question, Normally, generally speaking, the students who created the work should be the creators. So they would have copyright in their homework, in their assignments, in their presentation materials, so on and so forth. Unless, unless what? Unless the students are asked to sign and give their copyright to the school or university. That means they must have signed something, maybe when they are admitted to the school or to the university. If they sign a document saying that whatever copyright they have would be given to the school or given to the university, then so be it. Then the school or the university will become the owner of the student's work. So therefore, I would advise all students or teachers or educational institutions, please ask yourself, is there such a document for your students to sign? Because if so, then the copyright would change from the students to the educational institution. But that is an exception. If there is no such signed document, the students will own the copyright in their work. How about instructors? It is less easy to decide whether the instructor owns copyright because there are three things we have to check. Look at them on my screen. First, if you are an instructor, please check your employment contract to see what is your normal duty. I mean, maybe you are asked to teach, but are you asked specifically to create teaching materials, to create a particular PowerPoint? Does it really matter how you teach? So on and so forth. So your normal duties would be the first thing you have to check. Now, in other words, if you are only asked to teach and you are given freedom to teach in any way you like, then maybe the teaching materials are your work. It does not belong to your employer. But on the other hand, if you are someone who receives very detailed instructions from your supervisor and your supervisor said you must do this and that, you must do, you must do this PowerPoint, you must do this um, teaching material for online teaching, so on and so forth. So in that case, if that is your very specific duties, then that might belong to the educational establishment that is your employer. So that is number one, you have to check what is the scope of your duties. Number two, you have to check the copyright law in your place, in your territory. Now, for example, on the screen, I have shared with you. In Hong Kong, we have section 14 saying that if something is made by an employee in the course of employment, then the employer should own the copyright. All right. I have also checked in the Philippines, section 178 is actually more detailed. It sets out two scenarios. If the employee is doing something within her normal duties, then it will go to the employer. But if the, no, if the employee is doing something that is not within her normal duties, then the employee can keep the copyright. So now I have shown you where to find the law. When you have time, please go to the online version of your copyright legislation. Just check the section and then see whether your law has any specific provisions. And number three, you have to check is whether your school or university has any copyright policy. I can tell you, I have checked for HKU. If we simply searched HKU copyright policy, we would see that HKU has the policy of giving all the copyright to the teachers, to the staff and to the students. So that is made very clear because it is available on the HKU copyright policy website. So please check these three things, your normal duties, the copyright law in your place, and also whether you have any school or university policy, because the policy would override what is stated in the contract or in the law. So do remember, check it before we answer question number two. Now we go to question three. 
how to enforce copyright. Now, this is quite straightforward, so I will just briefly go over it. There are basically two ways to sue um, for copyright infringement. The first one is called a civil claim. A civil claim would be for the copyright owner to take the initiative to sue the infringers. In other words, the copyright owner would have to instruct a solicitor in other words, you would have to incur some legal costs, you have to pay the lawyers to draft the documents, to serve it on to the um, infringers, and then to bring the infringers to the court. So this is quite costly and time consuming because you have to do it all by yourself if you are the copyright owner. And what can you claim then? You can claim two things. You can claim monetary compensation and or an injunction. An injunction here means that you can restrain the infringers from doing something. Maybe you want them to take down some infringing material from their website, to stop reproducing your work, so on and so forth. So to stop them from doing something, that is called an injunction. And in addition, we also have a criminal claim. A criminal claim is only for large scale reproduction or sharing of your work. So usually it will be sharing or reproduction, mass production in the course of business involving making profit, so on and so forth. So criminal claim would be dealt with by the government or customs officers. They will be prosecuting the infringers, not the copyright owner himself. And a, cop and a criminal offense would be punishable by fine, that means you have to pay a sum of money and or imprisonment. So this is quite a serious offense and therefore think twice before you mass produce anything in the course of business if it is without the copyright owner's permission. That would be criminal liability. Finally, and this is the most important, and this is about virtual instruction, because in virtual instruction, we teachers and students, we are both producing and using copyright works. So in producing or using copyright works, how can we avoid copyright infringement? I have three practical tips. They are proportion, purpose, and permission. What are they? Proportion means it is only infringement if you use someone else's copyright work substantially. So in other words, how can you avoid copyright infringement? Don't do it substantially. All right. Number two, purpose. There are exempted purposes in relevant legislation. For example, in Hong Kong, we have sections 38 to 88, more than 50 sections in our legislation saying that these are permitted exempted purposes, no copyright infringement. I've also checked in the Philippines, it will be section 184 of the relevant piece of legislation. And the third permission, it is the most important because there is no copyright infringement if it is done with the owner's license or permission. And that is why Creative Commons is so important because Creative Commons is a kind of license or permission. And I'm going to elaborate on these one by one. First, so what is meant by substantial or non-substantial? It is not straightforward because we look at both the quality as well as the quantity. Let's say there is a 500 page book. If I copied 200 pages well, in terms of quantity, I would say this is substantial and therefore this is copyright infringement, sorry. What if I just copied the conclusion, only five pages? I'm sorry, because it is the conclusion. It is the essence, the most important part of the book. So in terms of quality, this would still amount to substantial copying. In other words, in both cases, there might be copyright infringement. Now, but then I see that, well, this is quite artificial. I mean, how to decide whether something is substantial or not? Now, if you think that this is a little bit difficult, a little bit ambiguous, um, arbitrary, then I suggest that you rely on the other two practical tips, which are much clearer and more reliable. So the second tip is look at the relevant legislation to see what are the exempted purposes. Now, just take Philippines and Hong Kong as an example. I have checked. In the Philippines, just like in the United States, we are using fair use concept. Fair use means so long as your reuse of other people's material is fair, then it will be exempted, no copyright infringement, and you can do, use the work for any purpose. In other words, there is no specified uh, limited purposes in the Philippines or the United States copyright legislation. But in places like Hong Kong, Australia, United Kingdom, we use a more narrower concept that is called fair dealing. And fair dealing, this phrase means that you are only exempted if you are doing the, what you are doing fairly and also for specified purposes. 
that means the specified purposes, they are already exhaustively listed in the legislation, exhaustive. So I just give you on the screen some examples from the Hong Kong Copyright Ordinance. Section 38, private study and research would be permitted, exempted. Section 39, criticism, review and news reporting. And then we have one very important exception in Hong Kong, which is about giving and receiving instruction and in particular use of the intranet, that is section 41 capital A. And finally, I'm sure we all love playing sound recording or film in a classroom. That would be section 43 in Hong Kong. And I emphasize that in the class, it doesn't really matter whether it is the teacher playing or the students playing the sound recording or film, we will both be exempted. We will not have any copyright um, liability under section 43. And I remember in the registrants questions, I received one question about, is there any difference between say universities, secondary schools or tutorial schools? Now looking at the list here, uh, just use Hong Kong as an example. For section 43 about playing a sound recording or a film in the classroom, then it doesn't really matter whether it is a physical classroom or a virtual classroom, whether it is a university classroom or secondary classroom, or even a tutorial classroom, they would all be permitted under section 43. However, section 41 capital A, which is about the intranet, now that is a little bit more specific. It only refers to programs um, that will lead to the award of a, a degree, a certificate or a qualification. In other words, for section 41 capital A, then only formal curriculum, like a secondary school, a primary school, a university will benefit, but not a tutorial school. Now, one last takeaway from this screen is that I also noticed in the registrants question, there is one question about how to cite, how to make proper citation. Now, there is one misunderstanding. I think many people would simply assume that uh, there will be no copyright infringement if I cite the source. I am sorry, this is wrong. Because acknowledgement or a citation only avoids liability if it is under the criticism and review exception. In Hong Kong, it will be section 39, but not for other purposes. In other words, for other purposes, you need to fulfill the requirements under the relevant statutory provision. Just giving acknowledgement or a citation is not sufficient. Another scenario where acknowledgement will exempt you from liability would be when it is a Creative Commons license situation. So Leon will talk more about Creative Commons, but how we use all this, I mean, I have given you such a long list, purpose, permission, how can we use all these um, tips in practical virtual teaching and learning? I am going to show you my real life example, please pay attention to the screen. This is our Moodle page, this is my um, course Moodle page, and this is uh, my um, a video uploaded by my students, there are two takeaways, first of all, I invite all my students to choose a relevant Creative Commons license when they upload their multimedia work to this Moodle site because I know that students own the copyright in their creation. So if I want to use their production or if their classmates want to use their production, strictly speaking, we need the, the students' permission. So I invite my students to authorize stu teachers, students, classmates to share, to use their work under CC license. So this is a CC by NC license. That means the students, they want attribution and NC stands for non-commercial. So this is the first takeaway. This is how we can use CC permission to avoid infringement in virtual instruction. Another example I want to show on the right hand side, can you see this is our Moodle page where we actually remind colleagues, remind teachers that under the copyright ordinance in Hong Kong under section 41 capital A, if you want to upload something which is not produced by you but by someone else make sure that you have now of course our moodle page is password protected and the materials uploaded onto the moodle page for a particular course is not um, stored for not um, not stored for more than 12 consecutive months then we are complying with the requirements of section 41 capital a so this is an example of an intranet, such as Moodle, Canvas, or other learning management system, how we can make use of this intranet system to share copyright works without any copyright liability, so long as we do it fairly. So this is my last takeaway. 
what is meant by fair then? In Hong Kong, we have section 41 capital A. Can you look at the top right? There is a light bulb saying that the relevant section is section 41 capital A. And there are four factors, namely the purpose and nature of the dealing, the nature of the work, how much of the work has been copied and the effect on the potential market. Well, these are the relevant factors, but how can we interpret and apply these four factors? Now, I'm aware of the time and therefore I'm not going to elaborate on this, but never mind, because as Leon said, we have already um, uploaded this series of animation called Hong Kong New Copyright Classroom. And in these um, sessions, in these lessons, online lessons, we have already explained the meaning of fair dealing, the meaning of playing a video in classrooms, so on and so forth. So I would invite you all just simply search HKU Copyright Classroom, then you'll be able to see our animation series. And it is available in both English and Chinese with subtitles. So we hope that we have already shown you the practical tips, the practical application of copyright and CC license and where to find useful sources and material. So maybe it's time for me to hand over to Leon to talk more about Creative Commons as a very useful tool. Over to you, Leon. Yes, thanks, Alice, for the introduction. So, um, so explanation of the copyright issues. So again, let me uh, uh, repost the link again. So uh, maybe we'll fill out some the late comments. So you can check the today's uh, live deck as well as the very informed and also the live stream material. So you can actually share, feel free to share to colleagues or uh, we also later on. So let me just my screen again and also uh, see if I can, yes, uh, make a full screen. So yeah, so uh, today's, uh, <clears throat> the coming uh, part will be more on Creative Commons. Um, again, so first is a uh, uh, thanks for uh, Creative Commons Association. They actually produce a very detailed uh, contents on a training on Creative Commons. So you can check for this for information. They have the uh, trainings for educators, for librarians, and for them, uh, colleagues. And I also can make something based on that. Okay, so talking about CC license. Uh, works for uh, TNL. So there we are talking about two things. First is uh, creating, uh, using CC license or OERs for courses, for lecturing, for tutorials. And then second is uh, create asking students or even yourself creating CC license words, uh, OERs as an assignment or as a lecture material. So we will cover these two things uh, today. So uh, let's start from the very uh, basic or standard uh, definition of OER. So this uh, definition is given by some open education or advocacies uh, on uh, actually OER. So it's talking about free to free to download, edit, and share to better serve all students. Uh, now actually, there are uh, so maybe some students they may be have difficulties accessing the teaching materials or difficult to buy textbooks, etc. But it's also OER is also allow us to give us uh, flexibility and opportunity to do something beyond. Uh, just a lecture or tutorials. And uh, it actually OER movement actually stimulates students to remix things together to create something new. So uh, having OER give us the permissions to do so. So talking about uh, talking about the, uh, top, uh, the free materials. So some colleagues may think are free are uh, open. It's not true. So not all, all free educational resources are open. So here shows some examples. We can categorize uh, the contents. So uh, according uh, to a spectrum or level of copyright restrictions, uh, of course, some of them are commercial. Uh, some of them is actually paid by the library. So students can use it. For example, in actual uh, Hong Kong uh, Library actually subscribe the license and actually for us, uh, we can download courses, papers, etc. in within uh, actual free explore. But it's not, it's actually have uh, re uh, copyright restrictions. And even some books. So some books again is uh, free to learn, but you can use it for your own uh, for your own courses or for example copy the exercise for your examinations etc. So uh, again, so free to learn but not open for edit or teaching. And of course, there are some CC license materials. Uh, for example, for open test, they actually create CC license materials for you, so you can re-edit it and share it or use it in uh, different purpose. And be, uh, but meanwhile, there are also some CC license that are actually uh, no derivative. That means it's not allowed to do the editing. So that's why even for CC license materials, there are also a small proportion of them that are actually not open. So be aware. So actually not all free educational resources are open. 
Okay, so well, why is it why is it important? So uh, why should we uh, do the categorization? Because uh, we hope to use OERs to do the following things. Uh, for example, we uh, when we design the course materials or design assi uh, assignments, we actually we want students or want uh, teachers can make copies, can use it in different ways in class, in videos, or in other uh, uh, media can edit the content, modify the content, and can combine with different materials to create something new, and uh, can distribute, or that means sharing copies with others. So if the educational resource have the copyright, uh, actually uh, we will be limited and we may not be able to do the following things. But if it's OER, that means uh, the content are uh, open to all, and then we are allowed to do the following things. And actually this create some uh, chemistry, for example, the Wikipedia assignment that I will illustrate later on. So uh, having o using OER uh, can allow us to do these few things and actually inspire us to do something uh, with more opportunity or more, more opportunity of create something interesting and new. And of course, there are different examples of OER. So uh, uh, here shows an example. For example, test book will be uh, from uh, OpenStack uh, that I just mentioned. We have the open course fair. Uh, I even for me, I use the MIT OCW when I was in undergraduate. So I learned uh, some engine uh, materials, etc. And of course, uh, actually Creative Commons Association also provide a list of materials. So talking about image, video, audio, they have a list of portals and you can search for more information. And uh, there are some recommendations from me. So, uh, so talking about OGL, so in general, uh, I have some recommendations. First is try to adopt in a small scale first uh, because uh, it, it, is, it can be time demanding. So uh, to, uh, to adopt OGL, we have to search, have to dissertation. Sometimes we have to check whether the copyright is uh, okay or not. So that's why we, if you're new, so try to uh, adopt in a small scale first, for example, two or three lessons or two or three weeks of contents. And there will be more OERs in general education and or first uh, year intro three courses. So, uh, so that's why if you go for it, so uh, uh, try to adopt OERs, so try to adopt for these courses. And you may need to think about how to search and evaluate and adapt resources. There are some trainings, uh, most, of the, most of the time, actually the OERs are revealed by others. So that means actually it's quite high, uh, high quality. So, so again, you can use it, but of course uh, my concern is whether the content is um, compatible or actually uh, relevant to your own situation Then you have to make some modifications, et cetera. So be very. And that's why there are lots of restrictions or lots of things that we have to hurdle. So, I really recommend you to find support from internal units, for example, the libraries in your schools or universities, or teaching centers or learning centers, and even external units. That means, uh, for example, for CC, they have global network. For example, in Hong Kong, they have CC Hong Kong. And talking about OD, uh, open education, CC also have a side project that's called open education platform with examples, et cetera. So you can also get uh, support resource recommendations, samples from them. Uh, of course, uh, as mentioned uh, by Alice, so actually we should uh, design some assignments that stimulate students to use or remix and also offer, uh, offer the license. Uh, so this is also important. So uh, let's talk about creative commons. So uh, we will use uh, several uh, pages to talk about this. Uh, CC, com uh, CC is a standardized way to grant copyright permissions to creative works. And CC itself is also an organization managing uh, the tools uh, for searching, for licensing, and also have uh, groups, communities to share the experience. And they also organize training, for example, the Creative Commons certificate. And you can actually uh, uh, learn from them. So how to uh, how to remix, how to adopt it, how to make CC license works, et cetera. So talking about CC license, I, I, I would like to mention, so it's actually talking about three things. It's talking about some very legal detail, uh, legal code. So uh, will be readable by lawyers, but there are also some uh, layman 
readable contents. So which will be something like this or etc. And also is uh is also machine readable. That means uh, when you post the things online, actually uh, the the CC search can able to uh, connect or map to your contents. So it's actually quite uh, important. So, so talking about the CC license, as, as mentioned by uh, Alice, there are actually four elements. So here and then with these four elements, there will be six large kind of license. Uh, let's, let's talk about the elements first. Uh, again, the first one is to give credit to the licensor. Trivial, we should arrange others' work, uh, long, long commercial. So uh, in the and l contest in schools and universities, it should be long commercial, so it should be okay. Uh, uh, low, low derivatives, that means you can edit the things and then share to others. So that's why if you have to adopt to your own situation, then you have to think uh, more carefully. And then share alike, that means the things that you create based on a certain CC license content, you have to use the same license uh, to share to others. I, I guess for the creators, they want what they want is actually the impact of the project or the content. So and benefiting more students and more people. So that's why they sometimes they use share alike. And given those four elements, we can have six license. Uh, let me just quickly go through the content. Uh, for example, this is the CC license, the BY, just acknowledge the creators that it's okay. And some of them may want to have some more restrictions. For example, it can be used just for long commercial. It can, you have to ensure it will be shared to others uh, through the same license. That means uh, uh, just giving uh, attribution uh, instead of uh, creating some extra re restrictions. And of course, there are also the another free tier. So, uh, share it and also uh, make it to be non-commercial. And then the last two will be not an uh, open nice, no, not open. So that means uh, the content can not be treated as a OER for TNL because uh, you can't do the editing or uh, remixing and then uh, share it. So this is uh, not open. So talking about CC license contents. Uh, so, uh, it's not that difficult. So uh, the most important is actually given attribution. So this is the most important part. So uh, you can actually click the link to talk about uh, show more examples. Uh, the concept is actually giving title, uh, acknowledge the offer, and find, uh, identify the source and declare what the license is uh, on this uh, uh, content. Then that should be enough. For example, here show several examples. So you can see the title and then the author and then uh, the source also. So you can actually click the link and then jump to that uh, location. And the license is uh, CCBY 2.0. Uh, right now, by the way, so for CC license, right now is uh, actually 4.0 already. And of course, the second one is also a derivative. So if you edit something uh, uh, based on some other content, then you have to add something extra. And this is also acceptable from a uh, Creative Commons Association. So the last one is not correct, uh, not a correct citation. So somehow you can see, if you just give acknowledgement as a photo, Creative Commons, so it's actually not correct because uh, there's no title, there's no offer, there's no license, there's no source. So this kind of acknowledgement is not a correct attribution. So if you use CC license first, you will have to make sure you use at least, uh, uh, you should use the first two or the first is also okay, but still acceptable, et cetera. And then the second one is whether uh, you have to check the license because when you have to re uh, edit, you have to check the license. When you remix different contents together and then you have some more complicated situations. So, uh, so that's why you have to check whether the license allows you to do something and post it online. So uh, by the way, so, so after, adding a, uh, after adding a contribution, try the best to uh, upload the, con the, the, the work such that all those things can be uh, mapped or actually uh, uh, crawled by the CC search engine. Okay, another part is more on assignment. So teach with Wikipedia again. So this is a, a side project from Wiki Education. So uh, talking about, uh, so there are different uh, examples of using OERs for TNL. So one of the signature example is actually creating uh, Wikipedia articles. 
So there are lots of courses. So for example, this is from uh, USC, so University of South California. They, uh, the teachers ask students to create Wikipedia assignments, uh, articles as, a, as their assignments. So here shows one of the example. So Zoom video, I believe all of us are using Zoom right now, uh, or tried to have, have used Zoom before. So, and they ask students to write something or elaborate on the existing work. And besides the Zoom video communications, uh, there are also water pollution, bubble tea, uh, deep fake, even NFT, very popular right now. So uh, students being a editor, student editor, actually contributing a lot on this uh, Wikipedia. And here shows the, the dashboard for this course. So you can see there are around 18 students as the editor and to edit pages. And they have, uh, you can, you, you through this dashboard, actually the course teacher can uh, monitor the whole course. So when, when students edit, uh, how much they edit, where are the, uh, where are the articles, uh, where are the students, etc. So everything with the support of the dashboard, uh, teachers can easily and uh, organize, uh, structurally organize, uh, manage the whole process, which is quite helpful. And this dashboard is free. So you can see my name here, so my name. So actually you can free, create your own account and then uh, have this support and then you can ask students to do the work. And here shows the, here shows the impact. So the PFS is just one cost, but actually this uh, project has already support more than 4,800 4, uh, uh, courses already with uh, editing more than 100,000 articles and then uh, with uh, more than 400 million views. So you can see the impact of the, the, and the effort of students to on um, contributing or improving Wikipedia. And here shows the example or the ecosystem. Uh, you can see the teachers ask students to do uh, to write Wikipedia uh, uh, Wikipedia articles. So and then uh, students uh, add as a editors to research the topic, write something, and to think about the writing. It's, it should be uh, understandable by uh, international audience. And meanwhile, when, when the students do the editing, the teachers will guide and evaluate students' contributions. And then WikiU will provide trainings for students. So uh, teaching students how to do the, uh, how to edit the things, how to search for information, how to write things on Wikipedia with some correcting tests. And all, they also provide the dashboard and other resource for teachers to monitor the whole writing process. And then later on, so once the students complete the editing, and then this will be, uh, the articles will be shown to all the users that like, uh, which for example us, and then will be consumed. So you can see the ecosystem is like this. So, uh, so Wiki actually create and support a lot on this kind of movement. And since there are more than 4,000 courses actually uh, adopt the uh, Wikipedia assignment, so that's why, uh, they did some survey and uh, most teachers agree that actually this improves students' literacy skills, research skills. They will think about whether the contents uh, have copyright issues and, uh, and have to ensure it's accurate and accessible by the public. Think about whether the wordings can be understandable by the uh, general audience around the world. And they will be have the awareness to ensure the content is uh, copyright uh, doesn't involve any copyright infringement, etc. So improving the literacy skills, know how to do the research, uh, the content will be more accurate and accessible, so they have the awareness. And they, uh, they also have a uh, more willing to do the contribution to be volunteer in the future. And then they will be, should be more social, uh, socially and culturally aware because the things that the students wrote will actually be seen by the people around the world. So, so that's why they have the, some cultural awareness. Okay, so if you want to know more about the facts or the impact, so you can click the link or tap the link for more information. So how to get stuck? Uh, so uh, for Hong Kong New College, so you can actually contact us. So through the idea scheme, uh, we can work with you to create the contents as well, work out uh, how, how to design a Wikipedia or using OER, uh, uh, using uh, designing Wikipedia assignments or using OER for your TNL or for your courses. For other colleagues, you can also uh, contact or uh, go to Wiki Education. They have lots of resources and trainings, for example, uh, how to grade Wikipedia articles, 
for some specific courses, they have special hangouts and samples. So you can actually check for more information. So uh, just a brief recap. So actually, I, uh, we hope actually uh, uh, we have addressed most of the questions talking about copyright issues and creative commons. Uh, we have, if you want to know about very specific situations, so for example, uh, students play music in the, in the in campus or in classroom, is it okay? Uh, or for, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually check the link for the videos. It's, it's short, it's also very informative. And again, this project or this recommend is supported by a, a UGC project even for you. Um, we will have another webinar on hybrid instruction next week. So if you want to know more about this, so try to click the link. And that's the end of the today's uh, session of sharing. So uh, again, so I would like to uh, post the, I would like to post a uh, link again. So uh, for the today's that slide deck, recordings and evaluation for better. And then the rest will be Q and A session. So if you have any questions, to so use the Q and A box to raise the questions, and Alice and I will try our best to read it and also try to answer. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. So um, yes. So maybe we have two questions, Alice. So you, you can read the questions, right? Yes. Yeah. Um. So maybe I I read out the question, right? They cannot yes, see. Yeah. Okay. The first question: If I, as a teacher, use copyrighted materials for pedagogical purposes. For example, I use an image on my PowerPoint slides. Is it okay if I just put C in the brackets, owner's name under the picture? Um, first, I would like to ask, what is the purpose of your PowerPoint? Because remember I said there are three keywords, three practical tips, right? The proportion, the purpose, and also the permission. I mean, if you are relying on the purpose, the practical step, um, the tip about um, exempted purposes, then I would like to know whether you are using a PowerPoint teaching for a webinar like this or for some other administrative purposes, let's say, because the purpose will determine whether your acknowledgement would be sufficient. As I said earlier, a pure acknowledgement giving the copyright logo and the name of the author usually is not sufficient it will not avoid copyright infringement unless you are relying on one of the um, permitted purposes, such as criticism and review, or that is actually a CC licensed work. Now, so for teaching and learning, if you do something, copy something, um, if you have one of the legislation saying that you can do it, then it doesn't really matter whether you, copy, you acknowledge or not, because acknowledgement is about another thing, which is called moral right. Whereas copyright is about whether you copy a substantial portion of another person's work. So to answer your question simply, I would like to know what the purpose is. If the PowerPoint is for teaching and learning, then it should be fine. If the PowerPoint is for an online webinar presentation and which is not related to teaching and learning of a formal curriculum, it may not be all right. And so I would suggest that for an open public seminar like this, better go for CC licensed works. Then you will be assured that you can rely on the third practical tip that I shared, namely the permission, the permission um, uh, requirement. If you fulfill that, fulfill the CC license, then you should be fine. Yeah, uh, uh, Alice, maybe I have a follow up question on this. So for example, uh, right now, for example, uh, of course, uh, for teaching purposes, okay. But uh, sometimes, uh, if uh, after the lectures, we want to share the lecture recording or the to to the pe to, to people or still uh, collaborators beyond Hong Kong U or beyond the university, so is it still okay? I would think it is questionable because we are looking at the purpose. Now, actually, everything we do, everything we store, everything we share can be for a different purpose. For example, maybe I show something, I copy something for the purpose of classroom teaching. Now, that is definitely okay. But then I share the recording with a colleague for another purpose. Let's say it is for, um, I don't know, a teaching training purpose. It is not for teaching and learning purpose, then it may not be okay. So I would think the safest thing to do would be first, if possible, get the permission of the relevant person, the relevant copyright owner. That is why CC license is the best thing to do because we actually get the permission of the copyright owner. 
Or secondly, try to do it in a more private way. I mean, not do it publicly, because if you do it publicly, then it might actually attract some criminal liability. Remember I said earlier, if you do something on a large scale publicly, like a public seminar, then that might attract even criminal liability. But if you do it privately, for example, you don't really have to, now that is why we always say, do the minimum if you can. For example, I don't need to send a copy of the recording to my um, colleague. I can ask the colleague to come to my office and watch the, the recording on my computer so that I don't have to generate one more copy and I don't have to distribute one more copy because every single act of copying, of distributing may need permission, may need a specified permitted purpose. Okay, thank you. So thank friends. you. So we have the second question. All right. So, Does uh, private study and research permit a university student photocopying a substantial amount of a print book? A substantial amount? I don't think so, because even for private study and research under Section 38 of the Copyright Ordinance in Hong Kong, it must be fair. And what is fair depends on four factors, including the amount of the book that you are copying. In other words, you should not be copying more than necessary. So let's say you are writing an assignment, you only need maybe two pages of the book, but you actually copy maybe five chapters of the book. So that is not fair. Or another factor would be whether your copying is so substantial that it would amount the potential market for the book. In other words, because you copy these portions, you don't have to buy the book, which actually you should buy as a student. If it is a prescribed textbook, let's say, then I don't think you can rely on private study and research as an exemption. So we must still comply with the fair requirement. So not everything can be done under private study and research. I'm sorry, not everything. Okay, yes, thanks. And so uh, the last question is also on uh, copyright, yes. I see. If I copy articles from other countries, do I need to bear any responsibility or be sued in Hong Kong? I would say it depends on where the act of copying is done. In other words, if you are doing the copying in Hong Kong, then you should look at the Hong Kong copyright law. If you're doing the copying, now because we know there are many online articles, right, online websites, so it depends on where you do the copying. You do it in Hong Kong, you comply with Hong Kong law. If you do it in the Philippines, you comply with the Philippines copyright law. So that is why I have already showed all of you how you can actually check the copyright law of your territory. And then you can just, when you have time, use your mobile phone, check, and then just go through the relevant sections because they are all available online. So it will be the place where you are doing the act. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, yes, thanks, Alice. So uh, I, we have answered all of the questions. So may I know if our colleagues have some more questions you can actually uh, type here? Yes, so we have several more, yeah. Um, I don't know the YouTube. Leon, do you know the YouTube question? Oh, does... That means take down, right? Does that mean yes. take down? Yeah, so, uh, so talking about YouTube, uh, actually YouTube have a very, uh, very intelligent engine. So, uh, so on uh, actually spotting the content. So uh, sometimes for us, we also spot, uh, has been identified or some copyright infringement. Uh, most of the time will be more on uh, the music, yeah. So if you if you use it uh, if you use some music actually they have uh, the record and they will be flatted and then they will have some restriction on uh, not spreading to more people I uh, cannot monetize etc. The the issue is actually we can't declare in YouTube you uh, although there are some uh, categories so mentioning uh, it's used for teaching and learning but that's for just uh, categorization it's not talking about copyright so that's why uh, if you use YouTube. Uh, and you use some copyright, uh, like uh, con some content with copyright issues. Though so most likely they will be flat, and uh, and 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 that's a that's a problem because uh, using YouTube actually implies you will share to the public. So that means uh, in Hong Kong will be uh, what what uh, not in the exemption because uh, in Hong Kong for example the exemption is if you use it in internet it's okay, but in YouTube will be uh implying actually will be shared to the whole world. So that's why it's not for DNL purpose. Mm. So yeah. So uh how about yeah, I you... answer okay. Yeah. Uh I can answer the question about a teacher being asked to create a video lesson to be used by a school division, about 32 high schools. And um, the teacher intend to use a video clip of a movie. How do I do to avoid copyright infringement? I would say remember the three practical tips proportion, purpose, and permission. Now, if you can 
actually approach the um, owner of the movie copyright. Of course, you can get the permission, then you can use how uh, whatever portion of the movie you like, but that is quite impossible. So forget about that. So we have two more practical tips, the proportion. Now, in other words, I would suggest that you only use a very, very tiny bit of the uh, of the movie. I mean, but what is substantial? Once again, I said it is quite difficult, quite arbitrary. I mean, we don't really have a percentage to tell you is it 5%, is it 10% that will be substantial. So this is um, also a little bit ambiguous. So I think um, if you can say it is just for teaching and learning, I mean, you keep it say in an intranet, which is protected by password, just like Leon said, I mean, don't make it public, don't put it on YouTube, because then it will be available to everyone. And that would not be for teaching and learning. So try if you have an intranet, um, a learning management system, I mean, some uh, mechanism, some system that would be protected by password and only accessible by a limited number of teachers and students, for example, then it could be safe. So in other words, we should try our best to limit the exposure of what we are doing and limit the proportion that we are going to copy. We don't copy more than necessary. So I think that is the, the uh, rule of thumb, I would say. Yeah, so thanks. So uh, also the, uh, on one question, are you saying YouTube, uh, so using OER content and post on YouTube. So if it's OER, most likely you can share to anywhere, so for example, posting on YouTube. Uh, but the issue is a uh, uh, YouTube has their own engine may actually press something. So that's the issue. Also, consider whether you want to put things on YouTube for DNL. Uh, and 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 also for YouTube, if you upload the videos, you can declare the license. You, there is one is called standard YouTube license, and another one is called Creative Commons license. So that's why if you use OER content, that means uh most likely. Uh, your content will be become also uh, have CC license or, or some other part to be public or open and you can change into the uh, up, uh, declare your video to be uh, CC, uh, CC license and maybe it, it may be helpful yeah but okay. a bit, yeah so let me answer the following two questions um, is it better if we use non-copyrighted materials in our video lessons then Yes. Now, it depends on what you mean by non-copyrighted materials. I can think of two. Actually, I think it's always advisable to use um, materials that are no longer have copyright because we know that copyright only lasts for the life of the author plus 50 years. In other words, if you are using some very, 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 very old movie, let's say, and the copyright has already. But remember, it is the life of the author. That means the producer of the of the movie. I mean, not the date of publication, not the date of release of the movie. And that could be different, you know, because a person, I mean, the producer can live for a very long time after the movie is released. So if you want to make sure that it is no longer protected by copyright, you better check the author's, uh, that is the producer's name to see whether he is still alive. And if yes, to see whether it's still within the 50 years, because if it is still within the 50 years, then it is still enjoying copyright protection. Or alternatively, I think the best thing is to create your own materials, just like my copyright classroom. I apply for a teaching development grant and I did it all by myself. So this must be original work. And so I can use, I can show my copyright classroom in every lecture, every seminar I give because this is my own original work. So I think this is something we can all try to do, do our own original creations. Then we can just share them any way we like whether it's a public seminar or teaching and learning. Okay, one last question. Is it still necessary to ask for a student's permission if the purpose of using the work is just to validate that they did the activity that we instructed them to do? The answer is no. We don't need to ask for our students' permission if we just want to validate, to verify that students have already followed our instructions. That is because this is, we can assume that they have given us the implied permission to do this. I mean, that's the whole point of giving and receiving instruction. So there is an implied permission. In other words, students have, um, do not have to say it expressly, do not have to say they allow us to do this because this is all implied. We assume teachers will be permitted to use and to, to watch students' uh, multimedia productions or their written work for the purpose of making sure that they are following instructions. So in that case, we don't need express permission from the students because the permission is implied. Yeah, but I, I may have another follow up question is if we, we, if we need to uh, want to share some samples. So we, if we have a collect a series or uh, some copies of students work and we want to share to, the, to other students, then, then in that case, we have to ask for 
Uh, I would say, strictly speaking, because the students, they own copyright in their homework, their written work or whatever works created by the students. So my practice would be ask the students, you can do it specifically, I mean individually, you ask the individual students or you can say to the whole class that I will be or I may be sharing your work as exemplars with the rest of your of the class or with your classmates. If there is any objection, then you can ask the students to, to let you know, maybe. Yes, thank you. Okay, last uh, question. So I'm making my video lessons. I'm using no copyright issues, sound effects, music, and others. Uh, that will be all right because uh, we actually can search for sound um, images or other copyright works that do not have copyright issues. For example, there are some websites which provide free soundtracks. I mean, you can use the soundtrack without worrying about copyright. So if you are very sure that the soundtrack, the music, the images that you get are actually permitted um, by the relevant organization, the website, then you would be safe and you can just post it anywhere you like. But you have to check the terms of that website when they say you are free to use the soundtrack because they might have other conditions, right, Leon? I mean, they might impose some uh, additional conditions before you can use their soundtrack or their images. Yeah, so for example, uh, they may ask for uh, attribution. So you have yes. to give the acknowledgement, so details instead of just uh, using the uh, music but without any acknowledgement, then that will be not be okay. Exactly. Yes, yes. And, and with in YouTube, there are also a series of uh, soundtrack. Uh, you can use it as a background music. So if you upload to YouTube, and there will be some extra support from them also. Yeah. Yes, one last thing. Actually, you can do a very simple CC search for free images or for free sound or for free music. So you simply, I think this is a, 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 a a skill that we can acquire and that is when you have time just do a, a simple online search for cc images or a cc music then you'll be able to see a list of images or music that will be free for us to use yes thank you so yeah so we have uh 10 minutes today already so thanks again thanks colleagues for joining the webinar so uh i hope uh we hope actually uh, you learn something about copyright as well as cc and also we can uh ask students to and to we, you can base on using CC contest to make the teaching and learning to be more uh, with uh, benefiting more community, uh, more people. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of that minute. So if you if it's okay, so you can fill in the uh, uh, later on, you can share the slide deck, also the recordings to others, and also fill in the evaluation form. So that's the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.